Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, Episode 23, Hadoop. Take it away, Jason. Hey, everybody. So we're, uh, we actually got a pretty awesome question um, from the audience that we want to kind of start We have an audience? With. I thought it was just you and me and our moms. <laughs> so yeah, our mom had this awesome question. It was, how's it going? Wait, wait. Not our, our, our mom doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah. No. That, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom? My mom? This sounds like we're making bad mom, mom jokes, but I'm not really. Yeah, like, I think... I think I just dissed my own mom. Anyway, so, so Marco Aurelio sent in a question, and um, he's looking at doing some C Sharp .net um, coding for a website that he's interested in making. And um, he was sort of interested. His question was, uh, you know, he knows that like you know server side stuff, you know, the code and the the CPU is used on the server. And so if you have, you know one user you're using some amount of CPU if you have a thousand users you're using you know maybe not a thousand times but the CPU scales up right so his question is how can you big websites like is it true that big websites like eBay and Amazon and things like that you know run things on the server side and how do they do that and how does the server not explode uh, and then along those lines like what languages should he focus on learning yeah so I mean it sounds like he had a he had a question there he has an idea and yeah. so his idea was to kind of kind of build a website, but he's worried about it scaling. What technology he's going to choose? Yeah, totally. So, so you, I have a slightly slightly different different answer, and mine is that I think sometimes in the tech community and as engineers, uh, you know, you over engineer things. So this is yeah. a classical problem, and so having the issue where you can't scale your website because you're growing too fast uh, would be like a very good problem to have. I mean, there are certain yeah. things you don't want to do to aggravate it, or especially if you get to the point where somebody's funding you or you're making a lot of money and your website goes down and people are depending on you, right, that's a really bad problem. Right. But when you just have an idea, it is more important to get the idea out there, to start working on it, to find other issues like, okay, people, I need to shift this idea slightly or I need to do this, then to spend tons and tons of money trying, you know, like uh, if you ever read about some of these people that started like uh, Google, you know, it was two guys and some university equipment or, yeah. you know, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, you know, it was just like running in his dorm room off his computer, right? Like, I mean, none of these things started with like, I'm going to start with 10,000 computers <laughs> yeah, right. and I'm going to serve millions of, I mean, that's how you go bankrupt, right? Did, did you know, so like, sorry to interject, but Stack Overflow, the website that has, you know, many questions right. and answers for programmers, it actually started with the two founders answering all the questions themselves. Nice. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So they just, and I don't even, I think they were talking about it. They didn't even have a website. Like they had this form where you'd click submit and then they would create a .html file with your question Aww. and answer. Like that's how they started. And now Stack Overflow is gigantic. There's like probably thousands of questions a second, right? Right, so. yeah. And I mean, I think even you take that example, right? So there's an idea and you can read a lot about this. A lot has been written and this isn't exactly an entrepreneurial show. I don't think I said that correctly. I think it's pretty entrepreneurial. But uh, okay, we're kind of, okay, <laughs> right, right. Um, but minimally viable product, that's right. kind of like a word, right? So the idea there is, in fact, don't even make a back end to yep. Jason's example here of Stack Overflow, whether it be urban legend or true, the <laughs> internet shall tell, tell weigh us. But, uh, you know, if you just make a front end that looks like what the website would, people can kind of try it out and test it. You can get a ton of feedback and save yourself days, months, years of development time. So that's kind of where to start. And then, um, you know, from there, you can kind of, Jason will kind of address like, how, how does that work? Like, how does one serve millions of users a second? An yeah. hour? A day? Uh, Millions of know, users a day. Let's of go with there. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but to Patrick's point, just to wrap that up, the, uh, you know, even when I was making the uh, Trivapedia, that trivia, you know, Wikipedia thing, I started off with just, you know, having just a flat file and you just scan through that file for everything. So if I needed to find a user by the name, I had to search through the whole file of like thousands of users or hundreds of users to find that one. Uh, there's no index. Millions of users? But yeah, well, that's the thing. So it grew to where, you know, there's, let's say, I think now there's, what, like 2,000 monthly active users. And so let's say there's 100,000 users in the system. So I couldn't do that anymore. Like, I couldn't just scan through all the usernames. And so I had to, you know, I ended up making ZombieDB, which is open source. And I think I posted on the podcast on G+, on the podcast's page about that. 
But uh, so I had to actually make a database. But that came months later, right? And if Trivapedia, if, if no one was interested in it, then I, I would have saved myself the trouble of having to make that database, right? And I probably saved myself the trouble of doing other things, which I would have done if there were millions of users, right? So yeah, to Patrick's point, you totally want to start small. Don't worry too much about your server blowing up or anything like that. But now let's answer the question from a tech standpoint. Like, well, how does this work, right? Like, do all these guys like Amazon and Google and eBay, do they all just write JavaScript or do they, you know, do stuff on the server? So they do things on the server and it works through a process called sharding. And uh, Patrick can sort of help me out here, but I'm gonna take a first crack at it. Um, typically, you'll go to, let's say, Amazon.com. What'll happen is that'll go to a front end server so this server will get your request and it'll say, and there's several front end servers all around the globe. So you'll go to the front end server that's closest to you. So it'll take your request and it'll say, okay, what servers are pretty, you know, uh, lightly loaded? And the servers themselves, the back ends are constantly telling the front end, hey, um, you know, I, I'm not busy or hey, I'm slammed processing people's orders, right? So the front end server will look for a server that's not busy and then redirect you to that server. So then uh, you'll go to, your request will go to, through to that server, which will do all the things like query the database, see if you're logged in, do all that, all that stuff. And keep in mind the database itself is on another server. So, so you have- Set of servers. Yeah, yeah, set of servers. And so there's this other process going on where the database has a front end, which you know, keeps, keeps the, the load pretty balanced among all those database servers. And so this process of having all of these machines sort of working together and having the least used machine you know, handling your request is what keeps websites like Amazon and eBay up and running. And a big part of you know, doing this isn't, you know, what we're going to talk about on this show, Hadoop, is more for like batch processing. It's not things that you're going to do you know, in real time when you're accepting a web request. But just a big part of doing anything on the web or with big data involves sort of managing many different machines and routing work to one machine or the other, so. That's right. Yep. And cool. so, I mean, uh, yeah, and I think there exists server backend technology for many of the most common languages right. for people to write in. I mean, there's even Node.js, so you can write JavaScript on the backend and, and use yep. that as a server. You know, you can j just like all the major, I mean, Java, C++, I would assume C Sharp as well. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's all these things have um, back end pieces that you can write to there's middleware kind of stuff let's call it that handles this load balancing and splitting and then you write your server and your language on the back so it's I mean it's a, a slightly more than what language to use it's kind of like understanding this underlying and the problem but you don't really know where the scaling problem is going to have until you really are kind of almost done Right. So totally. something like uh, if, if you think about like a, a slash dot, let's take slash dot, right? So they have news stories which are being displayed, but that their bottlenecks are going to be very different than a site like eBay, which is handling transactions and a counting down auction or Amazon, which has to handle, you know, uh, when something sells out and they have no more and they don't want to oversell something. Yep. Right. These things are there's amounts of traffic. There's hits on data. I mean, those things are going to have different bottlenecks at different amounts along the growth curve of users and you know on how many transactions are being handled and that kind of stuff so i mean you really kind of if you solve it too early you risk solving the wrong problem yeah that totally makes sense yeah so all right well on to our news news so, so, so i have the first one all right or, or okay yeah so i'm doing the first one <laughs> I, I saw an article link today on hacker news which is interesting about the fast fourier transform so this is real. This is kind of like a FYI. It's not exactly news. It's not something updated, but it was a pretty good article. I, I kind of enjoyed reading it. So I have a little bit of background with what the Fourier transform is. Yep. So uh, without getting into the deep math, uh, <laughs> and this like this guy does a good job of explaining it thoroughly, but not if you just kind of skim read it, you know, you can also kind of get the gist. So Fourier transform. Oh, and there's code too. Which yes, is pretty cool. and he even posts like more detailed. This website's actually very interesting. We'll have to take a look at more and see if there's any other articles to be really interesting to you guys, or you guys just take a look and figure it out on your own. <laughs> yeah. But he covers a wide range of topics. But a Fourier transform in brief is going from the time domain to the frequency domain. So if you have some data that over time changes, so the example he uses is uh, audio recording. So you have digital samples over time. And you're interested to say what are the most common or most prominent frequencies in that sound clip. Mm -hmm. Then you want to transform from that time data 
to frequency data, which says, you know, at 80 kilohertz, I don't know if that's too high. I'm not good with my audio. Uh, I think that's right. Okay. 80, 40, I don't so, know. So, okay, Close some enough. some number of hertz, you know, <laughs> that, that this is the peak signal. So, like, oh, okay, you know, maybe that gives you some information or you want to do some sort of... Uh, uh, mutation of the signal and then transpose it back. But this is something that's very common. You'll come across a lot in a large amount of domains, image yep. processing, audio processing. Um, I mean, they, even stuff that seems completely unrelated, it can come up. Um, but yeah. It, yeah, compression of all sorts and things like that. Yeah. And um, this article uh, talks about a specific kind of version of that, the fast Fourier transform, and also the dis discretized, discrete version of that. So um, going from math to kind of practical there and uh, a lot of the implications. So it's a pretty good treatment. So if you've yeah. ever heard of that and wondered what it was or trying to learn more about it, um, I would definitely check out this, this article. It seemed like a pretty good description. Yeah, it's totally awesome. This is great. I'll have to give us a read. Cool. So I'm doing the next article. It's on the Oh Yeah. Oh Yeah. Oh Yeah. Oh, no, that's uh, that's that guy who crashes through the window. Or the whatever. Kool-Aid Man? Yeah, the Kool-Aid Man. The Kool-Aid Man's coming out with a console. What? Pretty awesome, yeah. Hopefully it's like bullshit and you could pour. But anyways, so <laughs> the oh yeah is coming out. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. I, I haven't ordered one because uh, Patrick has scared me off of Kickstarter. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm super interested in the oh yeah. Um, I still might <clears throat> order one off their website even though the Kickstarter is finished. But okay, um, So is it available for ordering off their website? Yeah, you can actually oh, pre-order cool. it. Is it the same price? Um, a little bit more? Uh, I'll find out. Oh, it's okay. But basically, you can order on the website, and it comes, I think, in March or April. Um, but it is a, for people who missed the episode on the OYA, oh yeah, it is a, I guess I'd describe it as an Android-powered console. So it's, so it's a console with a controller and, and all this good stuff, but it's totally Android, so any existing Android games you can play using the touchpad on the on the controller. And any new Android games will be able to support the hardware buttons of the Oya. Oh yeah. And uh, it's pretty awesome because we've never We should say it hooks this, up to the right? TV, so it's not like a phone. Oh yeah. It, it, it's a little box that plugs into your TV just like uh, Xbox. Yeah, or, or PS3 or something. We've never had an open system. So a little bit of history on consoles. Um, the way the PlayStation and Nintendo, uh, you know, Wii and Xbox, the way these things work is, um, well, unless you're Nintendo and you're awesome, but let's talk about everybody besides <laughs> Nintendo. The way that these work is you lose money on the console. So, like, every time you buy a PlayStation, the play, uh, Sony loses money. Well, on initially. That. I don't know if it, that doesn't normally hold true over the whole life of the console. Uh, oh, because they're well, no, they're cheaper. Because of a sk over well, I, okay. Oh Continue. yeah, I, I'm I sorry. See interruption. You. So th the point is, you at least they don't make a ton of money. I suffice it to say. On, That's on not the that. mo the main way they make money. Right. Yes. So they actually make money by charging developers for a dev kit. So for example, if you want to make a PlayStation Three game. Then you buy this dev kit, and the dev kit has a little bit of hardware, but I don't even know if they have hardware nowadays. It's probably all in software or firmware. But they'll send you probably a PS3 with some special firmware. But they'll charge you for the dev kit, I think it's like $200,000 for a dev kit. And the only reason why the price is so high is so that they can recoup some of the money. And the idea is, you know, people who buy your game are going to you know, are going to give you money and you're going to give some of that money, pass it along to the to the hardware manufacturer. Well, so. no, I mean, so it's worse than that, right? So, I mean, it's that for every copy sold, they have to, they put DRM on the game. So if you don't have, but it's, I guess this is kind of almost re, slightly different than normal DRM, which is that if I have own media, but that media is not signed by Nintendo, I can't play my media on the Nintendo device. Right. So, so the you have to go to Nintendo and they... You know, I'm doing air quotes here. They <laughs> test your software to make sure it's not going to break the console or isn't a virus or, yep. you know, anyone, it doesn't crash. It's good, right? And then basically with their permission, then you can turn around and you're allowed to sell that game. But they, you owe them, you know, X percent or dollar amount. Oh, that's true. Some for everything that you sign. Yeah, that's yep. the most, com I think, I believe that's like a very common way. Yeah, I think there's an initial out. like, like one or 200K investment just to keep like the small people out of the market. And then there's also a rev share. So this is talking to a friend of mine who works for EA like a long time ago. So it might be different now, but, um, but yeah, so, so the, 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 the point of it is, you know, Patrick and I can't make a game for the PlayStation 3, right? I mean, we just don't like, uh, have those resources at hand, right? So you have to be a big publisher. 
or or Nintendo has to come to you. Like World of Goo is a common example where they're a really popular indie game. Um, they did really well in Flash, and I think they were out on mobile even before the Wii. And then Nintendo contacted them, and some agreement was arranged, etc. Um, the thing about the Wii is it's a completely open platform. So like any game that anybody puts out for Android, like Trivapedia, you could play it on the OUYA. Like any Android program out there will run. And so it really just sort of opens up the game console experience to like to the whole world of developers. And that's what's really exciting to me. So. And the, the general trend has been that along those lines, right? So like even the Xbox, yeah. there's like, was it Xbox Live Arcade? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, maybe I'm pushing. I think PlayStation has something similar, and Wii U has something similar, yep. and even maybe the Wii did, right? So the main games that you go to, you know, Toys R Us or Target or Best Buy or I don't know where everybody goes these days, <laughs> whatever your your in your country the local equivalent is to buy buy a game, right? There's those, which is kind of what we're talking about, but then there's these others, but those still have limitations. Like I remember reading something about when Minecraft came out for the Xbox, right? So they had some people doing this and then they had an update and then it was like, oh, if they wanted to update it like a patch again, you're supposed to go through all this testing again, but that testing costs money. So like, it's like a thing like you can't, they wanted to just push it early and push it often, but that didn't, like that was not compatible with how the money was set up and so it caused kind of a problem. Yeah, yep, totally. And so sometimes people leave kind of like broken, broken games because they just don't have money to, to push a fix for it, and that's bad. And the other problem too is, although there is an Xbox Live Arcade, there isn't a developer. There's a developer ecosystem, but not to the extent of these open platforms. Like could be, yeah, yeah. Like for yeah. example, we talked on last year with that Coco Two DX, which is it's not a game; it's just a library that you can use to make games. Well, for you to do that on Xbox Live Arcade, I'm assuming you would have to be able to like publish like the library. Like, I'm not quite sure how that would work, but on an open platform, you just give all the source code. And the person can take your source code and link in the, the Android libraries, and it just kind of works. So the ecosystem is much more healthy on Android. And so this is a very positive development, right? So like yeah. Ouya is on track. They started shipping the developer consoles, which are very similar to the regular consoles, but already kind of like opened up so the developers can do what they need to do, run unsigned code, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so this is a positive Kickstarter story. Yay, Kickstarter. So hopefully they'll stay on track, and early next year we'll be talking about the reviews of Jason's Ouya console. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right, so I think you have one now. All on, right, so... Uh, uh, future of the web. The future of the web would be HTML8. No, oh, no, no. Man, well, Maybe that's, that's far in the future. HTML5? Yeah, at is, this rate, is, that's like the year 3000. It's <laughs> finalized. This is, you know, this is one of those stories. I, I mean, it's kind of interesting just, just to talk about that. I, I think it's kind of slow, these uh, ratification of these things. Yep. Like, we've already kind of entered the HTML5 zone in my mind. Like, uh, like, it's generally used, right? But yet only just now did everybody kind of agree on what that meant to some extent. Yeah. Which still doesn't really mean anything because... All sorts of reasons, but you hear this, like, remember when uh, wireless Wi-Fi in, 802.11n was coming out, right? It was draft in. You could buy draft in oh, routers. Oh, yeah, I remember And draft in routers weren't guaranteed to be compatible with in. And then, like, a year or two later, right, then it was like, oh, now you can get the actual in ones. Yep. I mean, it's just, or uh, I remember, too, like, C++, right, even, that went through this whole thing about, oh, we're going to come up with a new C++ oh, OX. Oh, so long. And it took yeah. over 10 years, and then it was, like, <laughs> finally C++ yeah. 11 or whatever. It's hilarious. So, I mean, it just sometimes we forget that, like, the world moves on past these standards bodies, but the standards bodies do play an important role in kind of saying like, this is, you know, what HTML5 really is and really contains. But even then it's not done. Like they still have other work to do to kind of make sure everything's okay. It's not like finalized doesn't mean like it's done. It means like, oh, now we can move to testing and compatibility and, you know, actually making it an official like HTML5 Thing. Yeah, it's really just almost like a social or political thing. It's basically, you know, like let's say everyone complains about Internet Explorer, right? Especially older versions of Internet Explorer. Like Internet Explorer 5 doesn't do what, you know, Firefox and Chrome of the same era do. Or maybe 5 is too old. But but you see what I'm going with this. So this is their way of saying, you know, HTML5 is real. You can make content for it. And if someone doesn't support it, that's on them, <laughs> you know. And and so this it's a, it's like a political thing to motivate people to to switch. And I I'm pretty sure uh, if you're using an old browser, 
and you go to a website nowadays that has HTML5 content, they'll actually have a little link saying, hey, you know, your browser is super old, you can't display this website correctly, and you know, and you should go get a new browser. Whereas, you know, before the specification was complete, they would just try and make it support everything. So yeah, and I mean, um, we should say also this is by the W3C Foundation or W3C Console. I don't know what the, the C there it's is. Actually, W3C. Oh, Consortium. Okay, yeah. thank you for saving me. No worries. Uh, the World Wide Web Consortium. Yes. Okay. And uh, you know, it, it is a good thing. It is you know that they've finalized it, and also they've taken time to announce that they've begun the draft of HTML 5.1. Woo! Oh man, so did, did they keep the uh, peer-to-peer? HTML5 was supposed to have peer-to-peer support, but like no browsers had actually implemented it to this day. But I mean, so basically what, what that means is you could have a BitTorrent client totally written in HTML. Like you just go to a website and you just start torrenting like on like the site, you know, it's just craziness. And uh, I, I know I read an article where they said, uh, you know, no browser will ever support this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't see anything about it in my uh, research that I'm doing right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. All right, but we'll, it's okay. It's all right. Uh, maybe we'll have a future topic about this. Yeah, totally. All right, so I think you're on. You're up next. Tell me about some uh, sweet desserts. Some sweet desserts? Well, I've just been eating some raspberry pie. Oh! Yes, been eating from the raspberry pie store. <laughs> you bought raspberry pie at the store? I did. It was delicious. Yeah, it was It was one of those Safeway specials, but you have to have the card where they harass you, you know, the Safeway club card. So, like, now it's like every time I go, they want me to buy another Raspberry Pi. I'm like, no, no, you people. So, <laughs> Patrick is, like, dying. So, okay, so Raspberry Pi store um, has just launched, what, today or a couple of days ago? But it's pretty cool. The idea is if you own a Raspberry Pi device... Um, you can go to this store, you can download apps, um, assuming you somehow transfer them to the device, maybe you download them with the device itself, and then um, you can just start using them. So they have a number of free apps. There's Free Civ, the Civilization clone, um, some other free and open source games that are that seem to be ubiquitous, like Battle of Wesnoth seems to be on every possible thing. Like I have Battle of Wesnoth on my gumsticks, my phone, my like three computers, so. A lot of these open source games, it's just as soon as something new comes out, they try and get themselves on there. But um, there's a number of awesome things that you can uh, that you can install. Some are free, some cost money. But if you have a Raspberry Pi or if you're thinking of getting one, um, definitely check out the uh, store.raspberrypi.com and see what's available. So is the Raspberry Pi the Ouya before the Ouya? That's a good question, right? I mean, a lot it's of like these a store and a game, and it's a. I mean, it doesn't run Android. But I mean, shy of that, and it's not nice and bundled, and it's. But I mean, it's, yeah, that's a good point. You know, actually, a uh, coworker of mine, I was telling him about the remember the Android Stick PC that we mm-hmm. talked about on the yep. last show, and how I want to get one for Christmas. And he was saying, <laughs> "But do you really think you're gonna get? I'm, I'm just like, you're gonna buy one for yourself for Christmas? No, we should talk about things we want for Christmas. <laughs> but like, I, I, I normally those kinds of things is like nobody, like really, like who's gonna? So this is kind of so my parents ever since I was maybe like seven, they've always just asked me what I want for Christmas because they just they, they don't know anything about like computers and things like that. So so at tra- as tradition holds, my mom asked me what I wanted for Christmas and And, and you just, explained to her like go to this specific page. Pretty I had I to give the- her a link, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Right? I had to give her a tiny URL. Cool. But cool. um but yeah, so so uh you know you know my coworker said, well, you know, if you get this then you're stuck with Android, you should get a you know a Raspberry Pi or a Beagle board or something. And and that is kind of true. Like if if you get Raspberry Pi, then you have just a pure Linux shell with you know you know you could sudo app, you can install packages, you can do whatever you want. If you have Android, then you're stuck in the Android ecosystem. And so I haven't yet decided which route I'm gonna go. We already sent the link, dude. I haven't sent it yet. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I, it's sitting in my uh, like saved messages, but not sent. You know, in Gmail. So uh, yeah. I'm holding on. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll get an update about this. Uh, this is the last one sure, we do. Everyone wants to I don't know, know about our, my mom's bot. We're, we're, recording, <laughs> we're recording this before. Well, no. We want to find out which, which camp you fell into, which you decided. Ah, Not okay. necessarily which you got for Christmas. Gotcha. But uh, I don't know if we'll release this before or after. We're recording this before Christmas. So. That's true. Yeah, we're recording it in advance because we're both going to be gone for Christmas so and New Year's. So, uh, so we're right. recording some shows in advance. So, uh, yeah. 
So yeah, we so, will find out. So we will have already known what we will have gotten. Yeah, when, when you we will have. when you guys listen to this, I'll be playing with my. Oh, we just caused a quantum. What is it in Back to the Future where you you've broken the space time continuum? I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Time for tool of the show. Tool of the show. Show, 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 show. So my tool of the show. show, show this show, is show. like the tool that I use more than anything. Like more hours of my day are spent using this tool than probably any other program or anything. Sledgehammer. <laughs> That's a measuring tape. <laughs> yeah. It's called shoes. No. <laughs> so my tool of the show is Emacs, and. Uh, Emacs is a web editor, or sorry, Emacs is a text editor. Web I editor. Say, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> text editor, but it is so much more than that. It uh, has a ton of features, a ton of macros. You can have uh, like 20 files open in the editor at the same time. And 20? You can do, well, you can have infinity files open at the same time. And you can do things like find all occurrences of patrick and change it to gives jason a hard time in all 20 files like you could just type escape and then find replace all files or whatever so so it has a bunch of like little macro support and uh, it does has all these like cool tricks it has a, a color theme picker you have yeah. colors so you start off with like you're blowing my mind i know this is insane you start off with like a white background and black text which i just can't deal with so uh, i pick the uh the uh, clarity theme, which has black text, like a like a grayish, like not not completely white because too much contrast, like a nice soft gray. Coming next week, Jason's favorite Emacs theme. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just a bunch of cool macros. There's an Emacs wiki, which has just a ton of things to make your life easier. Like for example, like just a short anecdote. You might have something like a file which has a number colon and then some text. And you just want the text after the colon. Like you just want to get rid of the number and the colon, right? So like if you're just using Notepad, you'd have to do this by hand, line by line, right? But in Emacs, you could just Could quickly, you just do it from the shell? Yeah, you just could like write like a setting. shell script to like, you know, cat the file, go through set and oct and things like that. But in Emacs, you actually do like a regular expression replace, like almost trivially. Or you could use something that had a column editor. A column editor? But what if it's like the colon moved a column oh, because there's too many digits? Oh, that's true. Okay, that would be yeah, bad. Yeah, that would yeah. be bad. All right. You so, didn't fully specify the problem. So you can so so you can tell Patrick things that Emacs is for people who you know are on magic mushrooms or something. <laughs> Come on, man. Where are you going with this? <laughs> You're trying to make us lose our clean rating. What I guess it's still clean, but not like. What editors are you on, Patrick? I don't edit my code, man. I just think it. Oh, and really? then like you write in binary. I just have uh, telepathy <laughs> with the computer. Oh, that's pretty epic. Do you have one of those headsets? Did you yes. Ever, that was such uh, a fad. I know. I wanted to get one of those things that like, read your brainwaves yeah. and like hack I, that. I tried one in Best Buy a year or two ago, and it had this like platformer game where if like you thought about moving right, it moved right. And uh, I could never get it. You have to train. I mean, almost all of them have always shown, like, you have to go through a set of, like, exercises. Oh, yeah. Like the old dragon dictionary thing where you'd have to, like, it would translate the words you spoke or whatever or write write them down. You'd have to read, like, a chapter of Shakespeare to an act of Shakespeare to, uh, like, train it. So that's the same thing. Like, you need to go through some thing to train at least now i did that but maybe like i could be pretty scatterbrained and so like i kind of think that when i was like i wasn't focusing on the training part of it just remember there is no game (laughs) yeah there's There's no spoon (laughs) there is no spoon (laughs) so what's your tool of the show well okay so i I dodged your question but i haven't actually be in that weird camp of nerds who thinks uh ide (laughs) is is like a, a amazing invention of modern times where I can have 20 <laughs> files open, I can have colors, and oh I don't God. need these crazy things called like these crazy escape key combination macro. Uh, um, that's my yeah. that's my camp. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, but man, uh, so no, I, I do appreciate that that sometimes you have to open up a shell and, and you have to do stuff there, and, and or you're SSH'd into a computer. Yeah, yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's like a, a a thing of last resort. Yes. Okay. So in other words, you're on the 21st century. But I just offended all of our audience. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I might be the only person amongst our audience who uses Emacs. If you use Emacs, I think then, people, all right, here's my thing, and, and I'm really gonna get in trouble now. But this is okay. I'm gonna say it anyways, because that's how I roll. All right. Um, so 
I think people like the idea of being really, really nerdy, so they just say these things, and they it's not they're not true. Like, like what? Like vi or die. Oh, VMAX yeah. Vmax yeah, server. Yeah. I mean, that's not an actual phrase. I don't. I just couldn't think of one. But like yeah, you know, like oh, I only use one. vi for everything, or like oh, I only what's the there's like cult of something. I don't know all these things, right? Like yep. oh, I only use Vmax, and I'm sure there are people who do, and and I'm I'm sure that's what you meant. But I I really feel like most people, it's not really true. Yeah. Right? Like. Same thing as like I remember there's all, there's all these people talk to like oh Linux this Linux that and it's like what do you run at home like oh Windows <laughs> yeah right it's yeah. like like I don't have a problem with that just like own up like if somebody makes something good it's good like don't you don't have to like oh it's made by Microsoft it must be terrible yeah like yep. I, oh, come on I mean if it's good it's good there right? is like, a, de- a high level of zealotry with Emacs and VI it's true a lot of people no hate doubt. like the iPhone and the iPad like oh they're terrible right and it, and it's like in reality like okay fine you might think that but I think most people just it's oh it's because it's Apple yeah. doesn't matter if like you could provably show that it was the best thing like people would still like oh it's Apple it can't be good yeah. and then vice versa too other people were like oh it, if it's not made by Apple it's gotta be terrible Yeah. so I think nerds like for some reason or geeks like really fall into this trap of like like we say we want to be open minded we want people to accept our thing but it's like in reality we try to like uh, I think everyone is though even like you could be I had a friend growing up who's really into skateboarding and he was always like oh you have a Veriflex that's a piece of crap just because it's a Veriflex you know what I mean so I think everybody who's like really into something has this like brand loyalty but uh, but yeah so the thing about tech though is tech is very functional so like to have brand loyalty for something that doesn't necessarily have a style or where the style doesn't matter. Like it's one thing to be like, I really like, you know, express jeans. And it's like you do it knowing that they're not gonna like make you walk faster, you know? <laughs> but 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 it's like, oh, I really like Emacs, and then it, for Fido was to make the argument like Emacs makes me a better coder, which I don't believe, then then now you're putting, you know, you're putting like a uh, like a, you're turning something that is like a style, like a personal preference, into like, oh, I'm functionally like a better program. Well, but even if people say like, oh, I'm more productive using Emacs and an IDE, but their problem is like, okay, well, like you know, did you try all the IDEs? Well, no. Did you try one? Did you stick with it long enough? And if you kind of dig, it's like a lot of times, like, well, yep. you know, I tried it for like a week and I just couldn't stand it. Well, I mean, <laughs> did you like pick up Emacs and start using it hyper productively within a week? No. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I mean, I doubt it, right? Maybe if you're like some savant, I don't know, maybe, but like, no. Okay, anyways, my yeah. tool of the week What's is tool Chrome week? Browser Sync. It's pretty awesome. It's not really like a tool of the week. It's I'm totally sorry. a tool of the week. I totally cop out on all these. It's okay. <laughs> Um, so I, no, I your really like this tool was awesome. I'm still using oh, that. Oh, I downloaded good. it during the show. And you said one show. of our other tools of the week you were still using. Yeah, I'm still using KeyPass. Yeah. So, yeah, so your, I, okay. your tools are a winner. All right, yeah. all right. Better than Emacs. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so I extend trouble. the olive branch and I get my hand cut off. Man. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyways, um, so Chrome browser thing, if you don't know, Chrome is a browser made by Google. Yep. And, um, and, and one feature that I, I've been using Chrome, and I, I like it, I mean, eh, but I, I, I like Chrome. And one feature that I've decided I really like is across my devices. Um, that if you have Chrome and you sign into it, which, yeah, I, I mean, we can get to all the debate, but all right, whatever. So you sign into it, and it'll synchronize your bookmarks. It'll synchronize. You can see what tabs are open from your other computers. Yep. Um, and that's like a really good feature. And I think now, like, I, somebody's pointing out either Firefox ships it, like, by default or it's yep. an add-on or something. I, I don't remember. But that browser sync functionality and whatever browser. I happen to use Chrome, so that's my tool of the week. But I, I, they may all have it by now. Yeah, or, browser or sync is awesome. And now Turn it on. It's it, awesome. It even works with mobile. Right. So on my iPhone, I have the Chrome, and I can look at what oh what was that page I was looking up on my computer at home and I just go like my home computer and like oh that tab yep. you know bring it open it's amazing like especially I notice it a lot when I'm using directions like I'll be at home and I'll look up directions for a place and then I don't want to like I mean it's not a big deal to retype in the address but it's so much easier to just pull up your phone and say show me my desktop tabs and the directions are there like done ready to go but how do you enter all those key combinations for Emacs on your phone <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, I'm well, done. The last I hit, one. That was the last I one. Hit I'm the done. Escape key. <laughs> I'm done. I'll imagine if there was an Emacs editor for the phone, how hard that would be. It has just a custom keyboard. Yeah, that's true. You'd need custom a keyboard, keyboard that, that had like Control S or something. Like as I, a key. I'm sorry, I'm done with the joke. <laughs> Anyways, browser thing. All right, that's pretty funny. Time, time for book of the show. Book, show, book of show, the show. show.
That was pretty awesome, Echo. Okay, I'll go first. Yeah. You went first last time. That Echo. Did you write that in uh, in Emacs or was that a script on Audacity? I wrote it in C sound. <laughs> in C sound. Um, okay, you guys can look that up later. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> didn't get the joke. So, so my oh oh. Oh, should I, I was go, gonna first? go first? No, I'm going oh, you first. go first. So I don't have uh, programming. Um, Jason's is going to be related to our topics. So that's why he's going to go second. Okay. So I, I, I'm, I like sci-fi, science fiction. Totally. Uh, and fantasy as well. This one, I, it's science fiction, but it kind of, it's, yeah, a little bit of fantasy kind of as well, but mostly science fiction. Um, and that is Anathem. This is a book by Neil Stevenson. It's really long. Like I mean, I, the whole time I warned you. I thought that I thought that I, I misread this, and I thought it was Anthem by a- Ayn Rand. I thought that's where you were going with this. Okay, Anathem by Neil Stevenson. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, and um, it's it's a really long book. I don't. I think it's like uh, bordering on like a thousand pages or oh, something. Oh wow! Um, so here the paper book paperback is nine hundred eighty one pages. Wow. So it's really long, but it's it's really good. Um, so this is going to sound like Patrick. Why is this the best book? You have to stick it out through the first couple hundred pages. So, first couple hundred pages are a little bit rough, but it is yeah. worth it. It's like a huge investment, but like when you make the investment of like, oh, okay, what's what's going on here? It's really. Good. I don't want to do any spoilers about what the so farther well, part of the story. But it starts off, and you're in a monastery, mm-hmm. and it just starts describing like a whole world which is like slightly different than ours. And like you kind of begin to pick up that there's some things which are different but kind of the same. And it just like really – Neil Stevenson just goes into like great detail about like all the functioning of this monastery. And it's not – lest you get, be confused. It's not like a religious monastery like you would think of today or in, in, you know, in kind of our world. So you kind of got to stick with it and, and see it's a – it's something huh. slightly different. And again, I'm trying not to give away because some people, you know, really want to have all that surprise of the book. Um, so I don't want to give more than even the back cover would say. Oh, but okay. I, I check it out. It's really good. Um, and like I said, you got to stick it out for the first little bit. Um, yeah, it because, got good reviews. Yeah, it, it's a little – you got to st- – you just know you're going to read the whole book. Like just commit like I'm going to read this whole book. And it's only 11 bucks. It's not bad. I mean that's a, like uh – what uh, a cent a page? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you can get on, you know, e the Kindle or whatever through Amazon. Here is like six dollars. Oh, even better. I mean, it's good, you know, or even the mass market paperback. I don't know what the difference is. Only nine dollars. Oh, um, yeah, right. So uh, okay, we're sitting here like reading Amazon prices on the air. This is fascinating yeah. podcasting. But check it out. <laughs> it's a really good. I mean, I really like it. And if anybody has read it or does read it after this recommendation, like let us know, like or any of the books. Oh, that's a good point. Like, you so should for people who bought the the book of the previous show and people who buy this book, etc. Or are already have it or whatever. Yeah, Maybe. you already okay. have it. Um, you know, if you like the book or if you hate the book, let us know. So, yeah, I'd be curious to see if you have a better book, are... let us know. Post on Or if you hate G+. this whole segment or <laughs> if you hate the show, post on G+. No, <laughs> if you um so like you know some people might be like, "Oh, head first, you know, design patterns is decent, but I also really like this other design oh, that's a good pattern point. book." Yeah. yeah, feel free to post on the G+ and start start a thread where, you know, you're only going to help out the rest of the community by by contributing. So. Yeah, and if you want to leave a, a really horrible comment about what we should be fixing on iTunes, that's cool. Rate it 5 stars cuz those are the ones <laughs> yeah. we read. <laughs> and then just like tear it up. It's fine. Yeah, if we rate if you rate it five stars, then uh, we'll mark it as useful. And then, yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> just kidding. Okay. All so, right. Sorry. Uh, so so that's Anathem by Neil Stevenson. Anathem. But then I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how you say it. I'm not no, exactly right. sure. Okay. Yeah, well, it's definitely not Anthem. No. Because that's missing an A. So, um, it uh, my book is Hadoop: The Definitive Guide, and uh, I've actually been reading this book for a while now. Um, trying to sort of understand more of the like Hadoop internals and and the way like Hadoop sort of does different things um, um, on the back end. Um, so as somebody who like I feel like I can call myself a MapReduce expert. Like I might get destroyed for that by somebody who's like crazy expert, but I, I know a ton about MapReduce. I work a lot with like MapReduce and Hadoop internals and things like that. So, so you just um, set yourself up. You know that, right? Yeah, I know. I'll bring it on. I feel like I can take it. I wow. accept the challenge. Unless. All right. Unless, unless we get like Jeff Dean or Sanjay Gemawat, and... the original creators of MapReduce, unless they uh, comment. That would be awesome. Yeah, actually, I, I could take abuse from them. I'd be worth it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, you guys, that would be programming throwdown <laughs> at gmail.com or on our G Plus page. All, <laughs> any, any of you want to say anything? Go ahead. Yeah. So, I feel like I've been doing a lot with MapReduce. And, uh, well, we could have I, them on the show to argue with you. Oh, yeah, we should see. They're in the Bay Area somewhere, so. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, 
So this book, even as somebody who does a lot of MapReduce and Hadoop, the book is incredibly useful. It's a great reference, has a lot of examples. It, it really quickly answers the question, why do you use Hadoop, which we'll hopefully answer ourselves. But, or but they it, want you it explains book. it in a lot of detail, <laughs> and uh, it has a ton of extra content. So uh, if you like this show and you're interested in in Hadoop and you know things we talk about, this has a has a ton of great examples. So. And it's got a cool elephant on the cover, dude. It's pretty epic. It must be awesome. Now, do you know why it has an elephant on the cover? I think so. Hadoop is the name of the creator's pet elephant toy. Yeah, like his his child's pet elephant. Toy. Oh, his child's okay. Yeah, yeah. So so Hadoop wasn't created by a five year old whose pet elephant he named. That would okay. be epic. That would be pretty awesome. He's the most epic five year old ever. So <laughs> that was you as a five-year-old. Oh, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, on to on to our programming language. Hadoop. Okay, so or, or, I have to I have to caveat that I said programming language. It's not really a programming language. No, it's Hadoop. But that's okay because I noticed our title isn't programming language throwdown. It, like oh, only hit me this week. Like is that totally weird? Like you've been true. doing twenty-three of these episodes now, yeah. and I never hit me like when we named a show. We talked about always like about programming languages, but really the title is programming throwdown. So like yeah. I mean, and we're totally in our wheelhouse here. You could definitely throw down Hadoop versus like versus All Reduce or Spark or some of these other you know frameworks. So there's, def- there's a throwdown to be had here. You, you already so. threw it down with Emacs. Now throwing down that you're an expert <laughs> on Hadoop. Let's bring it. Yeah, get her done. <laughs> so. Hadoop. It's um, not even that late at Did I tell you I'm actually getting... No, no, we got to say... <laughs> I'm, real quick. I'm, okay, all right. I'm, I'm getting a bib. So uh, I want to get a bib for a baby. Like the kind your hose hooks up to on the faucet? No, no, like the kind where like they puke and it lands on the, the thing like that they wear or whatever. I want to get one of those and I want it to say... For I, you. For, for me. And I want it to say, I ate and made Hadoop. <laughs> Oh, I'm just getting the stare down from Patrick. I don't, I don't get it. I'll write in Emacs. I'll, let me think about it. Maybe if I start laughing in a few minutes. Okay. Well, it ends in OOP. Is it a poop joke? Yes, it is a poop joke. Okay, now I'm getting a different kind of stare. It's like a despondence. Okay, so let's give some history on Hadoop. Hadoop was based on MapReduce, which was something created by, as you mentioned, Jeff Dean and Sanjay, Sanjay Gemawat um, at Google. Um, so they created something called MapReduce. Um, they wrote out a paper explaining how MapReduce works. And then Doug Cutting, who is uh, another engineer somewhere in the Bay Area, um, I think he made a startup. Is that right? Like he made yeah, his own company? Yeah, and he's working on an open source version of it. He was inspired yep. by the paper. Right. He right. began working on it. And then at some point, Yahoo either like bought his team or he joined Yahoo. That was sometime around 2006-ish. And so then he kept working on it while he was at Yahoo. Um, so he actually, the whole reason why he created Hadoop was because he wanted to support Lucene, which is an open source reverse index. And we actually talked about Lucene in the mailbag episode of the show, answering the question um, posed by the person who wanted to um, create his own, uh, like he wanted to index the web for Magic the Gathering. So yeah, Lucene uh, you know, is a reverse index meant for indexing you know, thousands, millions of pages. And Hadoop was something that Doug wrote to um, support that. So um, at the time, it was kind of meant for that, and it was sort of myopic. But since then, it's been uh, it's grown like uh, to an amazingly large scale. How and, big? Uh, the last, uh, the largest Hadoop file system that we know of is uh, run by Facebook, and it is a hundred petabytes. Do you know how much a petabyte is? More than a terabyte. How much more than a terabyte? A hundred. A thousand. <laughs> Ten thousand. That reminded me of that Monty Python where he's like, blue, I mean yellow, no. <laughs> so yes, a petabyte is a thousand terabytes. So all you guys who have like a terabyte hard drive at home, so a thousand of those, that's what- No, a hundred thousand of them. Well, yeah, you're right. It has to be more than that. A hundred thousand petabytes. A hundred thousand terabytes. Wouldn't it be a Would million? be a hundred petabytes. A hundred thousand. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So Facebook has a hundred thousand um, of those of those hard drives that that they're using to store all their. Well, of the data at least. So it yeah. might be it might be replicated. That's true, right? I mean, so that's just one. Copy. And that's only that's only what they've owned up to. They may have bigger. Yeah, that's true. They may be lying, right? Like it might be actually be smaller. Yep. Or it could even be like that. You know, somebody else has one that's like 
you know, just way bigger and they just don't want to talk about it. I mean, the stuff's uh, it's just, it's a competitive advantage. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. Okay, so you want to discuss some of the some of the features? What are the things that... So, you know, one thing we should mention in the beginning is Hadoop has become almost like an umbrella term. So Hadoop is the MapReduce for sort of, for doing this distributed processing, but people also refer to Hadoop um, as this collection of, of tools, with Hadoop being one of the things in Hadoop, which is really confusing. But let's talk about some of the other features, some of the other tools that come with Hadoop. Also, changing my answer again, I, I, was, I was being silly. It's 1,024, right? Isn't it? Because isn't it a oh, power of two? Yeah, yeah you're right. <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing. Oh, man. So, yeah, there's... So, okay, so, so let's do a little bit first. So, MapReduce. Okay. So we, we use this term a little uh, oh, that's maybe true. prematurely. So what what is map reduce? So yeah, I'll try and explain map reduce. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, that's a good point. So first of all, let's let's do a little bit about distributed computing. Um, back in the day, uh, people used to do um, and they still do, but but people used to be totally consumed with MPI and things like that. MPI stands for message passing interface. And so if you had a lot of data and you wanted to do something with that data, you would break the data up into pieces, then you would pass each piece to a different computer, and then um, the computers would probably like send you back some results, and you would put the results together. Um, and then if you, sent, if you passed the message to the computer and it died, your whole process would blow up. Well, or, you would or, have to have code to handle it. Yeah, or you had to say, oh, this machine died, so I need to like pass the message to somebody else. And so you had to be completely consumed with all of these like meta things that didn't really matter to solving what you wanted to solve, right? So, um, so it turns out that not every problem can be what's called embarrassingly parallel, where you just send chunks of data to different machines. But almost all algorithms can be implemented using something called MapReduce. And so the idea is you have, you take your data, you break it up into chunks. Then for each chunk, you execute a map on the chunk, which takes this chunk of data. It could be a sentence on a web page, or it could be a URL, or it could be, you know, any, any you know, atom of data, and then returns a key value pair. So for example, let's say you wanted to count the, uh, you wanted for every word on the internet to figure out how many times that word is there. So your map could take a page of the internet and it could scan through that page and then spit out a bunch of key value pairs where the key is the word and the value is the number of times you saw it on that page. So if you saw like the fox jumped over the dog then there's two those. So one of your key value pairs would be the comma two. Another one would be fox comma one, etc. So now all of these key value pairs generated by all these mappers, they're all kind of floating somewhere on, on, in your cluster. So you have something called a shuffle that takes all of the keys that are in common and all the key value pairs that have the same key and squishes them together. So if you have 10 websites with fox as the key, you'll just have one key with fox. And then instead of a value, now you'll have a list of values where that list is how many times Fox was seen on all these websites. Then you have, that's the shuffle phase. Then you have the reduce phase where you collapse that key list of values down to one answer. So in this example, you would take Fox and then 2121232424 and you would add up all those numbers together and you would say for Fox for the whole internet it's whatever 13 million or something like that and uh, the, co- the cool thing about this is that all these pieces can happen in parallel like the part that collapses all of the Fox values and the part that collapses all the bear values could happen on two different machines and the part that scans website A and when scans website B can happen on two different machines and uh, it all just kind of works and so as long as you're, and the MapReduce code also handles all these things like, oh, you know, the machine that was processing Fox dies. We need to send Fox to another machine. They've dealt with all that for you, so you don't have to do it. So that's that's a short summary of MapReduce. <laughs> and Hadoop is an open source version of this. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, part of this is going to be if you're going to, you said, you kind of started with something that was a little bit uh, presumptuous, dare okay. I say, which is, you start with everybody reading all the tasks, reading one page of the internet. 
That's I, would, where do you store something that's every page of the internet? You can't just like store that like on a NTFS or you know right, EXT. Right. You know, it, you know, a file partition like this. The, I mean, <laughs> it's so it's like, big. Yeah, I mean, well, not only the size large, but the number of files is ridiculous. Oh yeah, right. So you could run into problems. So I mean, one thing that has to go along with this is you have to have a distributed file system. So yep. first of all, you can't house all the data on one computer. Right. But then on top of that, even like how you would access it in a way that is efficient, so that you can have these tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of map threads working on this. You need a way to be able to retrieve that quickly and reliably and in a sharded manner so that you know that can take place very quickly. And, and they've handled that as well with the Hadoop file system. Yep, totally. Yep. So the, uh, the Hadoop file system uh, operates in 64 megabyte chunks. And that chunk could have one file in it. It could have a piece of a file. It could have 10,000 files in it if the files are very small. And so versus you know a regular file system which uses you know B trees and red black trees and things like that. This uses something totally different that's meant for you know gigantic files, millions of tiny files, all of these things. Um, and it expects you to access the files using something like Hadoop versus you know a file system which doesn't really know how you're going to access the files. Yeah. There's also HBase. HBase is a um, column oriented database written in Hadoop. So, you know, whereas HDFS is a file system, um, HBase is a database. So if you need to, you know, get rows by key and if you need to find all keys where the first name is this, if you need to do all the secondary indices, all that stuff, but you still need the distributed coolness from HDFS, uh, which HBase is built on, um, then you can use HBase and get that. Yep. So all this code that, that's running, I mean, if we begin to talk about hundreds, thousands of servers or even more, I don't know how high, how high you could go, <laughs> how high do you want to go, I guess. Um, you're going to have to have a way to keep that. So machines are going to die. If you talk about that many machines and some of this data could take a long time to process, I mean, machines are going to die. You might want to add new machines. You want to increase your capacity. I mean, that would be a huge mess. Yep. In the old, in the old, you know, olden days, where are you today? No, I mean, yeah. I mean, imagine if you're doing do MPI that and you yeah. had to deal with that, right? I mean, it would take you months to have to deal with the oh, this machine died, so I'm gonna send it to that machine, right? I mean, it's just, it would, that that's, it could be such a nightmare, right? Or or what if the machine that's sending the things dies? I mean, you don't want to have to restart the whole thing just because of that. So dealing with that, right? Yeah, that could be a nightmare. And so, um, so Hadoop's Thing which handles that is called Zookeeper, all going along the lines of like pet animals and things like that. <laughs> and so, yeah, Zookeeper is a distributed coordination service. And so, in like really short, what that means is somebody can write some data to Zookeeper, and uh, somebody else, if they write, try to write data and the data collides, Zookeeper sort of figures all that out. So, that if like if two machines both want to take the same job at the same time. Zookeeper says, no, look, only one of you guys get this job, things like that. Yep. So like we said, I mean, Hadoop is kind of, when people talk about it, they're kind of talking about all these kind of tools, which are kind of all necessary to, to get together and enable you to be able to run those map reduces. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, kind of now I, talking about the strengths, one of the things that like we talked about is you bring up more computers, great. <laughs> you, you know, you can have more threads and the threads can run on, it can run sooner. They don't have to be serialized. Yep. And so, I mean, it really, you can just scale this dot, dot, dot. You yeah, know, like totally. Just, you know, whatever, like uh, however much, I guess, time or money you have <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. determines, uh, you know, how big you can go or you need to go or have to go. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you could be on using the Amazon Web Services, which run Hadoop. Right, so um, they have a, a version that they've altered, I guess, or changed. Or it's not elastic, web services. Elastic yeah. MapReduce or whatever, right? Yeah, right. Which is, is very similar, yeah. So they have a, they have their version, which runs on their infrastructure. So they have, so like, you know, for instance, they may not, I don't, I think the way it works, and I, I'm, I'm speaking a little out of uh, my expertise here, but it's, you know, instead of having like a Hadoop file system, they have their right. version of the same thing, right? Their elastic file storage, which they kind of uh, hide from you, so you don't have to worry about it. You just put data there. And then you can run the Elastic MapReduce, which runs on that. So it's 
very similar and shares a lot of stuff with Hadoop, but it's not it isn't exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, totally. I don't know if it uses the same API or how that works, but I don't know. Yeah, but didn't uh, look into that. <laughs> no, yeah, I haven't done that with Amazon. But the uh, <clears throat> the other cool thing is it's fault tolerant. So you know all these crazy corner cases that you'd have to code up yourself, they've done that for you, and they'll even do crazy things that you wouldn't think about doing. But like one thing Hadoop will do is, let's say you have twenty machines that uh, are in your little Hadoop cluster, right? And you're running a job. And, you, and Hadoop detects, the zookeeper detects you're only running one job. And the job had eight workers, like eight, you know, let's say there's eight mappers. So Hadoop will say, well, you know, if one of these machines dies, you have to like start the whole thing over again. So let's just run like, since you only have eight, let's just duplicate all this work. Like run it on two machines and if one of them dies, it's okay. Or another thing they'll do is they'll know, oh, you know, you might be able to like pass some data or you might be able to arrange and do a little bit of the reducing in the mapper. Like these crazy optimizations that like we don't really think about because we're too busy focused on the algorithm. They've done all that grunt work, you know, and they've done all these awesome optimizations, sort of like using C++ instead of assembly, right? <laughs> like, exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, like MPI is like so low level that like you just have to end up doing like way too much. And that feeds into uh, one of the features I, I skipped over that, that you were particularly a little bit passionate about, Crunch. Oh yeah. Do so you want to talk about Crunch? Patrick's actually used used Crunch quite a bit. Yeah, well, yeah, you overstate, <laughs> sir. I, I, I'm not so emblazonly bald in to say that. <laughs> uh, but okay. <laughs> not, as, not to call you a liar, but I'll just, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So what Crunch is, is, is Crunch allows you to, uh, instead of having to use the kind of off the shelf nature of a lot of the stuff that MapReduce does or kind of fit into their paradigm, kind of even going again on, on what Jason said, extending it even a little further, even more flexibility in how you do these things and just allow the computer to handle it, right? The computers to mm -hmm. handle it. Just say, oh, you take care of this, right? So Crunch is an API for allowing you to at an even higher level say like, here's generally the data flow I want and here's the operations I wanna perform and all right, go. And so um, <laughs> if, you, if you kind of drew out like, oh, I need the data, these two data things need to flow together. I need to do some operation on them. And then once that's done, I make some calculation and then I need that to flow with another piece of data, you know, and then I wanna kind of join those together in like an inner join fashion or something, right? Like all these kinds of notions could become, they're like multiple map reduce, Hadoop jobs that would need to run. And there are, you know, things that you might have to string together very carefully. But <clears throat> Crunch allows you to just kind of specify like these are the way I want it to do. And it'll handle like, oh, I could merge these two together and run them at the same time. Um, yep. Or, oh, I need to spin up a new Hadoop run for this thing or for that thing. And it kind of allows you to do that much more simply and easily and in a way that's flexible and just allowing the computer to handle it. Yeah, yeah, and Crunch feels more like Java, you know, because you have these like uh, P tables, which are basically like, they feel a lot like hash maps in Java. So you can kind of take your existing Java code and if you need it to run on like a thousand machines, you know, it's not just a copy paste or you can't just change hash map to P table. There's more to it than that. But it, 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 um, it has things like get all the values, like get a list of all the values. That exists in HashMap and also in Ptable. And so it kind of feels more like, uh, like, like, you're, like you're just doing native Java. So it's good for people who want to get started right. with Hadoop and aren't used to writing this kind of stuff. Yeah, so that idea like Ptable or Pgroup table and it allows you to say like, oh, and everything in that, you know, in parallel do this thing, right? Like yep. go through and perform some operation. So that's what I was kind of talking about, maybe a little too high a level. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, that's how, you know, you kind of, it gives you this uh, API, but it really is a, uh, kind of almost, an ex, you know, classes and things that make it just look like, to Jason's point, it looks like you're writing Java code on some fancy, you know, hash map. And in reality, you're instructing Crunch to, in the back end, figure out how to arrange the map reduces and the, to, to be able to do that. Yeah, totally, totally. So there are some weaknesses to MapReduce. No. Um, <laughs> I know. You After think, we sang the praises? You'd think it would be just a panacea that would just be a cure-all, but no. Uh, one of the problems with MapReduce is it takes a long time to spin up and spin down. And so what, what, what we mean when we say that is spin up refers to, for example, let's say you're building a multi-threaded program. So the first thing you'll do is make the thread pool and actually ask the operating system for the threads. 
So that's kind of like our spin up time, right? And so to ask the operating system for some threads happens in what, milliseconds, maybe even less than that, microseconds. But to ask MapReduce for a hundred machines to do work on, uh, you know, or to ask like to ask a Hadoop zookeeper for a hundred machines is going to take you know on the order of seconds at least. I mean, it really just depends on your cluster, but it's not going to take milli or microseconds, right? So if you have, you know, a MapReduce job that that uh, adds two numbers, like goes through two files and then adds the numbers together, and the files are a meg each. You might just want to do that in C++, <laughs> you know, because by the time you spin up the machines, you know, send little, send numbers to the machines and, you know, then uh, compute the result and then store the result somewhere. Yeah, your C++ program would have run like 40,000 times or something. So there is a problem there. Yeah, there is something called worker pools. And the idea is, you know, if I have a job that I want to run over and over again, I can sort of prep Hadoop and I can say, look, Hadoop, you're going to do this thing a hundred times. So get ready for that. And then it'll do some optimizations there. Also, we talked about all these wonderful things of bringing on new computers and bringing down computers and all these stages and divide it and just, oh, do this little bit of work and then do this little bit of work. And that helps it be really scalable. But I mean, as you can imagine, all the data that's in your program, all those classes and everything need to be able to be serialized out. And yeah. then when they're read back in, they need to be deserialized. And sometimes, you know, oh, it can be said like, oh, I'm going to do this on the same machine. But a lot of times you have to do it anyways because you don't know, like, oh, am I going to be doing this on the same shard or not? Or is it going to go somewhere else? Yeah. And so it's just a, like if that takes a long time because you have especially some nasty intricacies, it, it could be a problem. But even in just in general, like that's going to be overhead. Yeah. And then the other thing, and there's some theoretical reasons why this is true that I'm not going to get into because it takes a long time, but but uh, there's excessive, there's a lot of materialization. So, you know, each of your mappers, going back to our word account example, each of those things that scans one page of the web has to put those results, all those key value pairs on disk, on that Hadoop file system. And then the reducer, the, the shuffler, sorry, that's putting together all the keys has to read those from disk and then put the reduced key values lists on disk. And then the reducer has to read from disk and then put the answer on disk, right? If you were just writing some C++ program, you would just put everything in memory. Or maybe you would only put you know, a bit of that on disk, like one stage of that on disk. So there's a lot of disk I.O. when you're using Hadoop. Um, there are some tools to sort of make uh, Hadoop a little easier to use. Um, one of them is uh, Pig, Pig and Hive. And so they're, uh, they're good for, if you don't want to have to write Hadoop, like raw Hadoop code, you can just put your data in Hive or put your data in a flat file, like a text file. Then you use something like Pig or Hive. They have their own programming languages, which are much more terse than uh, Hadoop. Yeah, I mean, with a lot of these things, that's uh, planning can take a long time, even right. It's like figuring out, like, oh, how how exactly do I want to divide my data? Yeah, you know, getting my data into the right place in the right format. Um, you know, that can take a that can take a lot of time. Yeah, totally. And so tool, these tools will help you with that. Yep. Uh, so um, we have Avro. I yeah. have no idea what that does, so that's going to be all you, buddy. Oh, Avro is like a thrift. It's like a serialization. Oh, okay, thing. okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about this. Okay. Yeah, totally. I'm reading your point, so. Uh. <laughs> no so, uh, so what is Hadoop used for? What is MapReduce used for? Everything. 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 I think there was a, in the white paper on Ma the original white paper on MapReduce, they said that it was. I don't remember. I think it was over half of computations at Google were part of a MapReduce. I think it was some very large number. Oh, interesting. But yeah. So, and Google is like a huge company, so. Uh, you know, and I think I'm pretty sure Facebook and all these companies uh, have probably similar statistics. It's kind of interesting to see what companies will say what, right? It's kind of like a little bit of a game. Like, oh, hey, we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're doing, you know, and then, but, you know, it's like, who knows, like, how, what percentage of the actual value those things are. They're just, like, kind of one-upping each other. Yeah. But only, true. like, slightly, and the others are just keeping quiet in the corner. And it's like, oh, are they embarrassed? Or, like, do they, like, oh, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm just laughing, <laughs> right? Like. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of interesting. But I mean, no, seriously, I mean, MapReduce, it, it pops up all over the places. Like, um, yeah. you know, even for doing like image processing, like, oh, you want to like do a whole bunch of, you know, look for objects in something or you want to uh, 
run the same little algorithm on things. I mean, people have done MapReduce to do that. Yep. People have done MapReduce even for like, I, I saw one guy who was writing a little bit of tutorial, like I think he was trying to convert like old PDFs and like do I OCR on them. Like he had a whole bunch of them. Oh. Like each uh, page of a you know old books that have been scanned was like a either just an image or a PDF. And he wanted to do like OCR on all of them, right? And like and then put them somewhere. But like you could imagine like if you have millions and millions of these pages, like, it would just be a nightmare yep. to figure out like a C plus plus framework and structure or Java, you know, structure to kind of do that. That could just I mean it could take a long time. But that I mean that's right in the wheelhouse of, of MapReduce. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, there's a ton of things you can do with MapReduce. The biggest thing is, you know, especially as sort of like, let's say you're an indie developer, you're just developing, writing code out of your house, right? But you want to do really big data kind of things. Like, for example, let's say you have a website and you have a few thousand people on your website and you're capturing all their clicks and things like that. Let's just take, let's say your website has a thousand people a day and each person click, like on average there's a thousand people and each person clicks once a minute. So there's, how many minutes in a day? I don't know. <laughs> Let's just say they click but, once in a day. Okay. So they, you have a thousand clicks a day. A th that's still 30,000 clicks a month. So if you wanted to go back through a year's worth of data, that's what, 365,000 clicks. Uh, that's a lot of data. And so, you know, you don't even want to do that on your machine because it's going to take forever. So if you wrote a MapReduce, you could say, um, you know, run it on your machine on like one day's data, make sure it works. And then say, look, Amazon, you know, you have this Elastic Cloud, it's totally awesome. You know, chug on this data, like run this MapReduce that I wrote. And, you know, Amazon will charge you however much that costs, maybe five bucks or something. Sure. To, to uh -huh. run or you do it accidentally the wrong way and then... Uh, How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. It just like accidentally misconfigured something and like it's really big. No. I mean, oh, and then they charge... It's like some really really out outlandishly large number. Oh, no. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, you probably can set a budget, I'm sure. I'm sure, like, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and then all of a sudden now you can run that same program on a thousand computers that you don't have to own. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, I think that's a wrap for for this episode. Yeah, Hadoop is great. Learn it; it's fantastic. We hope you will have or will have had a good Christmas. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, in the future, we hope Christmas will be awesome. Will have been awesome. Will have been awesome. That's pretty pretty well, wild. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Till next time. See you later. The intro music is Axo by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, adapt the work, but you must provide an attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.